The field of discrete choice has made tremendous strides in the last 15 years. There's been a complete transformation in how models are specified and estimated. And this new breakthrough has allowed us to examine types of behavior that we just previously weren't able to examine at all and to predict in more complicated situations than we've ever been able to deal with before. Recently, there has emerged, in fact, a consensus among researchers. I think there's emerged this consensus on how to go about modeling within this field, how to take all these developments that have occurred over the last 10, 15 years and bring them together in a modeling approach. Um, unfortunately, this consensus, this kind of concept of how to go about modeling in this field now, is known by only the few people that are actually working in the field. There's a handful of people who are active in this field, and I think we have developed a way of thinking about doing modeling. But it's not widely known. A lot of the concepts in this field are scattered through numerous papers in academic journals. Some of them are in papers that have only been given in conferences and are hard to get. There's also a lot of information that's just passed by word of mouth. Um, the purpose that I have in this course and the purpose that I have in this new book that I'm writing on this topic is to try to bring together these concepts to exemplify the unity that I really feel does exist in the field now and the excitement that has come from the development of these new methods. Um, so what I want to do in this course is to go through these methods, show how they interrelate to each other, and show how a researcher in any substantive field, labor economics, natural resources economics, transportation, would use these methods to develop the uh, models that they need to answer the questions that are relevant in their substantive field. Now, most of the new developments have centered on the concept of simulation. We can use simulation to calculate choice probabilities. We can use simulation to do estimation of models that are more complex than we used to be able to handle. And we can use simulation for forecasting. So simulation has been one of the big impetuses in this field. And that's why I'm calling this class Discrete Choice with Simulation. Really, the, the big breakthrough that has allowed us the freedom is this concept of how to go about simulation and how to do estimation with the simulation. This gives us tremendous freedom. What now we're trying to do is you just come up with a way to represent the behavior that you're interested in. And then in some way or another, there's going to be a simulation procedure that will allow you to estimate those models. So instead of like in the past, trying to find something that seemed good enough and yet was still tractable mathematically, we now don't have to worry about that or nearly to the degree. This, is, this opens up your empirical research tremendously. I think if any of you have been involved in empirical research on a substantive topic so far, you'll realize that as soon as you get into it, you realize the standard procedures aren't right for you. That your situation is unique in a certain way, that you've got particular issues that you want to deal with, and the standard procedures just won't really handle it correctly. Well, that's what simulation does, essentially, is allow you to build your own models, build your own procedures, and use simulation techniques to estimate and forecast with them. So it's that freeing exercise that is, is valuable. Um, now, at its basis, simulation is actually a very simple concept. It's hard to recognize this from reading some of the articles, but it actually is. Um, essentially, all you're doing with simulation is approximating an integral. Our basic problem is computers can't integrate. And so we have to somehow do that integration in a um, numerically acceptable fashion. And simulation does that. So kind of to put this in context, let me go through and um, show in the most general way possible where integration comes in and how simulation is used to deal with that fact. And in the most general form, you can think of any process with um, y denoting the outcome of that process. Somehow there's some outcome that um, it results from the process that you're looking at. That's caused by various things. We're going to take a causal perspective, as economists generally do. And you can divide the things that it's caused by into two groups. One is a group of factors that you, as the researcher, can observe. You've got data on 
or you can potentially get data on, and then another set of factors that you can't get information on. There's always going to be things that we as econometricians can't observe that affect the behavioral process. And so in general, there's going to be observed and unobserved things. The process that you're looking at can always be represented by some relationship that relates the factors that cause that to the outcome. And so we have H, which is the behavioral model. Again, this is fully general. We think of H as causal. You don't have to think of it that way. But the idea is that there are certain factors that go into the process that produces the outcome. Now, if we could observe everything, if we could actually observe these factors that we can't observe, then we could perfectly predict the outcome. That's the idea behind a behavioral model, is that if you could truly specify every single thing that's going on, then you could determine what the outcome's going to be. Okay, some of uh, doing that is physically and you know, even conceptually impossible. You can't always know everything. And so there's going to be unobserved things. But if you could, you could perfectly predict it. Given that we can't do that, though, instead of actually predicting the outcome perfectly and understanding the behavioral process completely, what we have to do is retreat instead to making probability statements. How likely is it, is it that a certain outcome is going to be? Um, so what we're actually doing is saying that there's some probability of this outcome based on what we observe and knowing, recognizing that there are things that we don't observe. So let's let to give, make this concrete, let's say that these unobserved factors, we treat them as random, and there is some distribution. We might have to discover that distribution for them, but there is some density out there for those unobserved factors. Then the probability of the outcome, given what we observe, is simply the probability that these unobserved factors happen to be such that the process leads to that outcome. So all we're saying is the probability of our outcome, given what we observe, is just the probability that these unobserved things happen to be such that our behavioral process gives us the outcome. Now there's actually a way to put this that's a lot more convenient and leads easily into simulation. Let's define an in indicator function. I is an indicator that indicates whether the statement in parentheses is true. Okay, That's equal to 1 if true, if the statement in parentheses is true, and 0 if false. Okay. With this indicator, we can now put this probability as an integral in a nice, convenient fashion. The probability of the outcome, given what we observe, is actually the integral over all possible values of the unobserved factors of this indicator function. Where this integral is over all the unobserved factors. All we're saying here is, for any particular value of the unobserved factors, what? On the left hand side, side, is it given x? Oh, you're right, given x. That's important. <laughs> yes. Probability of the outcome given what you observe is the integral over all the unobserved factors of whether those unobserved factors will give rise to that outcome. So this is just an integral over all the unobserved factors. Well, how do you handle an integral? If you want to calculate this probability or get your computer to calculate it when you're doing maximum likelihood estimation or doing forecasting or anything, you somehow have to calculate this integral. You have to evaluate it. And there are actually three ways you can go about doing this. The first is a complete closed form. That is, in this situation, um, to get a complete closed form, you make assumptions about H and F, which allow you to solve this integral analytically. So you get some parametric function that you can stick into your computer and calculate for this probability. 
Up until the last 15 years, that's what all of econometrics has been about. The, that's probably an overstatement, but it's, it's not much of an overstatement. The goal then was to try to find behavioral models and distributions of error terms that, when combined, gave you integrals that you could integrate explicitly. That was a huge restriction. It was a very daunting task because you're restricted to only things that end up giving you a nice closed form. Um, most of the models that were used at the time I wrote my first book fit into this complete closed form uh, format. Logit, um, nested logit, ordered logit, all of those, the reason they were so valuable is that they gave you a nice convenient function here. So for example, let's suppose a person has a choice of whether to do something, like whether to go to Hawaii, whether to buy a car or something. The utility that the person gets can be represented like that, where these are observed variables. That's coefficients of those observed variables and an error term which represents factors that affect the person's utility that you don't um, observe as a researcher. So the utility of taking the action, which can be either negative or positive, depends on things that we observe and things that we don't observe. Okay. Um, let's say the person takes the action only if they get a positive utility from doing so. If they know they're going to get unhappy from doing so, they don't do it. If they get a positive utility, they go ahead and take the action. We can now calculate the probability if we have one more piece of information. We need to specify the distribution of these unobserved factors. So let's assume that these are distributed logistic. The logistic formula was chosen because it allows this nice uh, closed form to come out. The logistic distribution has a density of E that, okay, and a cumulative of that. No, I'm sorry, that's that's extreme value. Let's give the just the cumulative here. Okay. Now if we want to calculate the probability of taking the action, or y is equal to 1, given what we observe, it's simply, we plug it into this formula, it's the, an indicator of whether utility is positive times the distribution of error terms, epsilon. This can be rewritten to make it easy to see what's going on here. Okay, so we're just taking the beta x to the other side. And what is this? That's just a cumulative distribution. It's the probability that the error term is greater than this thing. So that's simply 1 minus f We know that um, if the probability, uh, uh, if the error is greater than this, then it's 1 minus the probability that it's less than this. So that's how we get the 1 minus. We then just plug in what we know this cumulative distribution to be. So it's 1 minus 1 over 1 plus E. Negative of a negative is a positive. Okay. Or since it's 1 minus that, we do the arithmetic and end up Okay, so we have a nice closed form for our model in this case, whether a person's going to take an action. Okay, we did it by making a very simple behavioral model where the person takes an action if their utility is positive, and we measure some of that, and by finding a distribution that is convenient. Essentially, we assume this not because we believe things are logistic. We have really no way to know whether they'd be logistic, but because it gives us this nice formula. So there are a lot of models that can be solved in this fashion, and sometimes that will be sufficient. Like I said, all the models in my first book um, and uh, that you come across in most of the literature 
have this form. However, as you can see, when you're restricted to situations where you have to do a closed form, then you end up thinking in terms of your model in math terms instead of economic terms. You think, okay, what can I assume to give me the results that I need, which is a closed form, instead of what do I need to do to make my model represent reality. Okay. So this is important, but now we don't have to be restricted to it. The second possibility is complete simulation. For complete simulation, we simulate this integral instead of calculate it analytically. And the key to simulating is recognizing that any integral over a density is a kind of average. All simulation comes down to recognizing that an integral over a density is a type of averaging. So let me say what I mean by that. Uh, suppose we're wanting to calculate an integral of some statistic, we're wanting some statistic integrated over values of epsilon. These can be unknown, they are in our case, but this is any integral. So you're calculating some function of a variable over the density for that variable. You're integrating that. This is simply the average of t within the population f. Okay. Well, how do you normally approximate averages? If you want to know the average income in California, what do you do? You go out, take a sample of Californians, ask them each their income, and take an average of the results. You sample from the population. It's rare that you would actually go out and ask every single person in California. Even the census, as we know, doesn't do that. Um, so you go out and sample from the population and calculate your statistics on the basis of your sample. Well, that's essentially what we do in simulation. We draw from the population, the distribution of the unobserved factors. For each draw, we calculate the statistic we're interested in, and then just average them. So we approximate the true average with a simulated average, which is the obtained by taking draws from the distribution, calculating whatever you're interested in for those draws, and averaging the results. Now, every simulation procedure that we describe in this class, and practically every simulation procedure that I've seen, actually does this process. It's simply averaging something. They differ in what they're averaging as their statistic, what density they're going to be averaging over, whether it's the full density or a, a part of it or whatever. But they all end up like that. And again, it's sometimes hard to see that when you're reading the articles. So it's very important, I think, conceptually, whenever you're reading about a different simulation procedure, to try to figure out what actually is being averaged here. Just go in. And that allows you to see, OK, is that really what I'm interested in, averaging that? Or what is the properties of that kind of average? How does it compare to some other? So it makes comparison across the approaches easy. So always go in and try to figure out what's being averaged. The simulation procedures somewhere averaging, even if it doesn't seem obvious immediately. OK, so you can do this kind of approach no matter what your um, functions are. Here, we've got an indicator function being averaged over a density. So, um, Already, you see an, a, an, a, a simulator right here. You draw from this density, calculate that, and do it many times, and average the results, and that gives you an uh, approximation to this integral. We'll see that other forms of, um, there's sometimes problems with that form of simulation, and that's what the whole field is about, finding simulators that have better and better properties. Okay, and we'll find, but they all end up averaging something. So an example of this is Probit. Probit has been the source of much of the literature on simulation procedures. Uh, it's simulated by complete simulation, in the way we'll describe. And there's a variety of ways of doing it, depending on 
what the actual structure of the model is and different ways of representing this integral. Okay? So probit simulation falls under this. There's a third category though that is extremely important to remember. In a sense, there's a tendency here to think in these polar extremes. Either I can get a closed form or I can't, so I simulate the whole thing. But actually, you should always think in terms of trying to do as much as you can analytically. So partial closed form, partial simulation. Here what you do is try to decompose your error terms, the factors that you don't see, into two parts. One part you can, you can analytically integrate over, and the other part you can't. Whenever you can analytically integrate, you want to, as long as you don't have to force your model to get that solution. If it just happens conveniently, you should use it. And then just simulate the parts that you can't analytically do. Um, got notes here. So let's decompose our error term into two parts. That. And we know that the joint distribution can always be represented as the product of a marginal and a conditional. So let's say there's the probability of the first set of errors times, that's the marginal probability, then the conditional probability of the second set given the first. You can always decompose. Um, and then with this decomposition, we can rewrite this probability formula in a way that transforms it to be the average of something else, in fact, something else that's more accurate to simulate. Let's do two integrals over, the inside integral is over epsilon two, the outside integral is over epsilon one. Let's put a bracket around this part, okay? Now we have our indicator that x combined with both sets of errors, all I'm doing is expanding out this error vector to be the two parts, okay? The conditional probability of one set of errors given the others, and then we integrate those out, close the brackets, then the marginal probability for the other ones, and integrate those out. All we've done, this is just definitional, we've just taken our error, broken it in two parts, and then a marginal and a conditional. But what that allows is, suppose that this term right here can be analytically integrated. But there we have a closed form solution, and let's call it G, okay? And it depends on epsilon one because all of this here is for a given value of epsilon one. So given the values of some errors, integration out of the other errors can be done analytically. That gives us Now we're simply taking a function, an average of this g function over the distribution of the errors that we cannot integrate analytically. And this we approximate by simulation. The advantage of this is that we have gotten rid of some of the need to, uh, to, to simulate. That we have, by finding some subset of the error terms that we can actually analytically integrate out, we have simplified the problem and we've made it more accurate. Because anytime you simulate it, it's an approximation. It's better to be analytic, uh, get an analytic solution. A great example of the use of partial closed form and partial simulation is the mixed logit model. Mixed logit model is the um, most flexible model that we've talked about so far. It's more flexible than probit. It's definitely more flexible than logit, standard logit. Um, and in fact, any choice model, as we'll see, can be represented as a mixed logit. So it's an extremely flexible model. And that model has the advantage, actually, of having a closed form for the integration of some of their error terms, such that integration only has to be performed over the remaining error terms. That 
that ability to decompose the errors into those two parts and integrate, explicitly integrate some of them, is one of the main attractions of a mixed logic model. So we have the three procedures, complete um, closed form, complete simulation, and then a mixture of the two whenever that's possible. Okay, so the idea of simulation is, like I said, always to um, perform the integration and simulation is always, at least in this course, an average of something over a density. Here's the average, if you do complete simulation of this indicator function or some transformation of it, here it's the average of this analytic integral of a subset of the error terms. Okay, but it always comes down to that somewhere in the analysis. As you'll see on this, the outline of the course is to uh, first start out with models that have a closed form solution. These are the ones that were available 15 years ago. Okay? Logit, nested Logit are the main ones. Um, I want to go through those because they are still extremely important and they actually serve as the basis for, um, for uh, other models. In fact, mixed Logit, which as I've said is a very, very general form, this inside part is a standard simple Logit and then you are simulating over a lot of logits. Um, so to understand how to do mixed logit, which is a very general form, you need to understand what logit does, which is a, um, uh, a simple form. So we're going to start with the basic properties of discrete choice models and the closed form um, versions of those. And in the process of that, as you'll see for February 5th, I want to talk about how do you estimate these things if you were writing your own code. Most of these closed forms have already been written up into computer programs and you don't have to write your own code. There is code out there available for it. But I think it's useful to use those as models on how to write your own code if you're doing your own estimation routines because the whole point of simulation, the whole point of the field as it is today is that everyone gets to write their own models. You don't have to have the same kind of model as anyone else did. And so it's unlikely that you'll find what you want in, uh, any, of the in any of the computer packages. So learning the numerical approaches of how to go about writing your own code to maximize a function or do estimation in some other procedure is extremely important. We'll do that with closed forms and then you'll find when you get to simulation and develop your own simulation procedures that, uh, it, for your own data that those techniques will be usable. Okay. So that's what the numerical maximization lecture you're on is it's starting this process of how to do the computer work. Then we turn to different probit models with different simulators, mixed logit, and um, finally um, hierarchical Bayes. You'll find, see that Bayesian procedures are making a tremendous amount of progress. Um, and classicists have been a little bit behind on keeping up with this stuff. And it turns out that actually these Bayesian procedures can be used by classical economists, classical people who don't believe Bayesian stuff, um, but rather believe in a frequentist view of the world. You can still use these Bayesian approaches to get classical estimators. So all this Bayesian analysis that's being done recently using simulation techniques is actually immediately transferable over to a person who is only interested in classical procedures. So we're going to cover all that also. Um, you'll find out that it is another form of either complete or partial simulation. Okay. Um, now, I... There, there's going to be computer workshops throughout this class. So you'll each get your own computer account and I have uh, data sets, computer codes on the, on the machine. You can run them and then run variations and alternatives. So I've got exercises set up. I personally think this is extremely important. I learn models by coding them up. You start realizing what works, what doesn't work, what is difficult, what can be changed easily without affecting the model what can't be changed and is kind of fundamental to the model. You learn that, I learn it, through, through coding these things. Um, and so I would like you to really spend the time that's necessary on the, on the computer exercises. Um, also, I see this course as being, 
I think ever, you know, there's a tendency to take theory classes and you don't ever get on the computer, you know. Um, when you're doing your own research, you really need to know how to work the computer, how to get things you need, uh, how to interpret your models, and hopefully this class will not only just deal with simulation procedures, but deal with the whole concept of how do you do good empirical research. How do you match a model to your situation? How do you interpret the estimation results that you're getting? All that kind of stuff. And that only comes from hands-on experience of running the models on the computer with your data. So I've got data sets and computers um, code that you can use. And um, we'll have those. I think it's like about every two weeks there'll be one. And it'll probably, I mean, it's not a lot of time. It takes about two hours, I think, to do each one. So it's not a huge investment. But I think it's really important. Readings, most of the readings, if you go to the website, you can link to most of the readings there uh, uh, on the web. And the ones that aren't there now, hopefully will get there shortly. And uh, so I'm putting, this is a very sub, a small subset of all the important articles in the field. These are the ones that I think fit the way we're going about things and are the most important. Uh, again, Everyone here is self-motivated, and so you kind of read these to the extent you want or feel you, you benefit from. Grading. We have to grade the class, and we have to have a final. If we don't have a final, I have to send in a form to the Academic Senate explaining why we don't have a final, and it's easier to give a final than to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for grading, let's do it like 40% on the computer stuff. There, just do the runs, do the exercises, and turn in a copy of your output. Just clip it with your name on it, and that counts for the computer stuff. And then we'll have a final that counts 60%. Now, if you don't want to do the final, um, you can do a paper instead. Um, I think if you want to do a paper, it would be very valuable. I don't want people to feel pressured to do it if they don't feel they're needing to. But I think a lot of people are at the stage in their career where they've got a data set, they're starting to look at how to do modeling, and this can be a good opportunity to start doing these techniques on your data. Um, also, as I said, there's going to be data that I give you that are on the computer accounts. You might want to um, do a paper using those data. Um, and just do a variation on some of the work that's already been done with those data. Um, also, you'll find as we go through this course, this area is like a paper generating function. <laughs> Every time you turn around, there's a topic that needs to be investigated and that can serve as a neat paper, both from an applied and, and a, a theoretical perspective. So, you know, just on the topics that come up in this lecture, you could spend the rest of your career writing papers. Uh, so you might want to just find a topic as we're going along that interests you, do some um, empirical analysis of what the properties of two estimators are compared to each other, or come up with your own simulator, something. There's, there's just topics everywhere. So anyone that wants to do a paper instead of the exam uh, can do so. Um, you know, you can decide at the last minute. I, I'm, I'm really not motivated here too much by the, the technical requirements of course giving. The topic, I think, is sufficiently interesting that you'll want to do this stuff anyway. And that kind of leads to the last thing. What is the value of this course for you? Um, well, first of all, as I've emphasized over and over, it really does free up your research. You will find, if you've been involved in data analysis at all, that uh, what you want to do, you can't do with the CAN programs. Uh, you will always feel you're having to compromise what you really want to do with your models to fit into what the computer codes will allow you to do. And so this really frees you up. You don't have to be so concerned about that anymore. Um, you also learn the kind of econometric computer skills that you'll need for the rest of your careers. And from a uh, kind of a cynical perspective, it'll make you really zazzy looking on the job market. Uh, even if you're going in simply in an applied area, so you're not interested in selling yourself as either an applied or a theoretical econometrician, but you're a labor person or an I.O. person or whatever, even then, coming in with methods where you can say, well, you know, I've developed this procedure, I wrote the code, um, I'm using this kind of simulation procedure and that's better than this one because of the following reasons, it shows you that you're, it shows the audience that you're really a with it economist. You know 
where the field is right now. Um, and uh, that's important no matter which empirical area you're going into. So uh, just from that kind of perspective, it's useful. Okay, so let's see. Are there any issues, questions, whatever y'all want to do? And uh, then we'll have a break and come back and talk about drawing from distributions. <laughs> Anything? Are you going to let in everyone who wants to get in? Because I think the, the class, is, class is capped on Delaware. The class is capped at 40, which is what this room holds. And I don't think it's probably better to do more than that. Are there people that are on a waiting list that can't get in? I think there's some people that are just going to sit in and not take for credit. So, If there are people that want in that can't get in for some reason, let me know and we'll try to figure out what to do. But, um, you know, you want to have comfortable space. Yeah? Will the final be more theoretical or will it be computer? Um, well, it'll be something you can do sitting in a room for three hours. So you won't be doing it on the computer because that's what the university has is you know, they set this time aside when you have an exam and you either do an exam them or you write to the academic senate. Um, so it'll be theoretical in that sense, but it'll all be applied in the sense that I'm interested in how to use these things. Um, and uh, you know, so that'll come across in the exam. Yeah. Yeah. What computer program? Are oh, that's a very important issue. What computer program are we going to use? Um, the first week for doing the logit, we're going to use SST. But that's just to show you that you can do logit in a CAN program. SST is probably the most convenient. It's very easy. The commands you need, I'm going to have in the workshop there for you, so you don't even need to learn the syntax. But that's just the first week. After that, we're going to use Gauss. I use Gauss just primarily because I started using it and I've now got a lot of invested time in it. So I know it. Um, most of the codes I've written are in Gauss. But the programming skills that you develop can be used in any of the languages and it's relatively straightforward to translate them. People that are I interested in MATLAB, uh, you, you know, it's just syntax difference. So uh, hopefully, if you learn it all in Gauss, you'll be able to easily just use it in some other language afterwards. Or you might want to continue on in Gauss. Since you only want the output, it doesn't matter how you do it, right? Which that's right. Which your problem set in MATLAB, you, the question. You, that's correct. Or is there a standard like, problem that you say develop this? Or? I think it'd be great if you wanted to do all this stuff in MATLAB. The problem with that is going to be, I'm giving you codes. Wow. Sometime the code is like thousands of lines long. And writing, <laughs> rewriting that in MATLAB yeah. might be difficult. No, I thought you would not give us a code. You would give us, like, do this in the right? Well, I'll give you the code. And it might be a very long code. And I'll have you run it as it is. And then a lot of times, you can make important changes in the model by just changing two or three lines, if you know where to change them. You don't rewrite the whole code. So for example, if you've got a normal distribution and you want to log normal, you just go into where the normal is created, exponentiate it, and you got it. You know? So uh, the, it, it will be you're going in and making relatively small changes to these long codes. But to rewrite the codes in MATLAB would be a job. Now, actually, if someone wants doing research already, mm -hmm. doing in, in MATLAB and invested a lot of time. I know. You have the difficulty there. I would like, actually, if, if you want to do that or anyone wants to do this instead of the paper or the final, <laughs> to write code for Probit or mixed logit, general purpose pr uh, code in MATLAB. But it needs to be, it's very easy to write code that works for your own stuff because you, you know what the structure of your data is and things. To write general purpose code is much more complicated. You've got to allow different kinds of structures for data. You, you know, a variety of things. You'll see when we get into my codes that there's a lot of options for people. Um, so if someone wants to rewrite, I think that would be a great value to the research community at large, as well as um, uh, getting rid of your requirement for a paper or an exam here. So yeah, it'd be great. Um, and I'm serious about that. Weren't you going to write one in MATLAB? Uh, yeah, I was thinking of Stata. Stata, Stata. That's another possibility. Yeah. So, um, you know, and I don't want to say that it's hard. I just don't want you to think that it's a trivial test that you're going to do in a day. It's, it's going to, it'll take a while to write these codes. Uh, yeah? Are we always going to assume that we have uh, consumer level data, or are you going to approach topics of uh, data sets that are only firm level or shared data? 
Um, my analysis will all be on agent level where you're looking at the decision maker, not aggregated up. A lot of the procedures um, are applicable at aggregate levels. Um, for example, with mixed logit, I'm not going to be discussing the kind of work that Aviv Nevo does where he's aggregated mixed logits up to a market level and then looking at interaction of supply and demand using that as the demand structure. There, part of it is just, I don't work with those kind of data too much, so I don't have as much expertise in it. But more than that is, uh, you really get, the, the fundamental issue there is not the simulation, it's how do you get good instruments. Um, that's the fundamental problem that you have to deal with. And um, so the emphasis has kind of shifted. The simulation procedures become kind of uh, secondary or less interesting or less important than the issue of what constitutes a decent instrument and how do you get them. Um, here we want to keep on topics where simulation is, you know, really the big topic. And the behavior is, you know, the analysis given the simulation is relatively kind of straightforward to think about. So no, the answer is we will not be looking at market level data. It's important if you're doing that yourself. Anything else? Okay, why don't we break until 1 o'clock. It gives like eight minutes or so. And then come back. We're going to talk about how to draw from...